Atlanta History Center for the Veterans History Project. We're privileged to have today Alan Shannon Jackson, and this is Francis Westbrook, a staff member at the Atlanta History Center. Mr. Jackson, as you know, this is your story, your account. We want to hear about your experiences, so please feel free to begin when you're ready. Thank you, Francis. <clears throat> I was born in Atlanta in July 1922. I went through the Atlanta Public Schools, Spring Street, O'Keefe, Boys High, and then to Georgia Tech. My time at Tech was interrupted by World War II. I took the first year off and became a flight instructor for Southern Airways on the civilian pilot training program. We did that for a year and then went into the service as a civilian instructor on Air Force Basic down at Macon, Georgia, Cochrane Field. Uh, after about three or four months at Cochrane Field, they gave us a direct commission as a second lieutenant, but we continued instructing at Cochrane Field until the summer of uh, 43, I think it was. We were then assigned to the ETO to an air transport group. We went through the normal uh, POE, uh, the normal staging areas to POE Camp Shanks in New York and went to Europe on, on a converted English luxury liner in a convoy of probably 50 or 75 boats. When we got to England, we went to our squadron that we were assigned to and went through the, the began the normal operation which we did for about two and a half years. Most of the group that went with me were ex-civilian instructors. We did not go through Air Force training. So the first time they gave me a high-performance airplane to fly was a rather odd feeling. I hadn't flown anything bigger than a BT-13, and the first airplane I had to ferry was a P-47 Thunderbolt. Uh, it went on like this through all the airplanes until pretty much we got to fly every airplane we had in Europe uh, during the war. Uh, we ferried them around England, waiting for our transports to come to do the uh, original assignment. Towards the end of that time, we took a Thunderbolt to, or 30 of us took them, Thunderbolts to Iceland, uh, which was an interesting trip late in the spring across the North Atlantic. Later on, we took uh, Another Atlanta native, Earl Gerard and I, brought a B-17 back to the United States. The B-17 was to be made into a flying bomb, and I believe it was to be used on the sub bins or something in Norway. When we got back, D-Day had taken place, and we started flying supply and evacuation runs to Europe. We, we would carry supplies over to the Normandy beachhead and bring back wounded. We had a flight nurse on board for all these trips. Uh, we did that, followed the front all the way across Europe through Paris on east until, until we got to Germany. We moved our headquarters during that time from uh, England down near Oxford to Marseille, near Marseille. We stayed there for about six months and then moved to Paris. We lived in a suburb of Paris, Viroflay, and uh, stayed there till the war ended and, and uh, we were finally sent home. We had, it, it was interesting during the cargo and evacuation, we would go to rather rapidly made airports across Europe, generally taking bombs, ammunition, gasoline to the frontline troops and bringing back any wounded. We brought, also brought German wounded back. 
you could pretty well tell how the war was going by the age of the German troops. In Normandy, when we were bringing them back, they were young fellows, probably late teens, early twenties, evidently the cream of the German army. As we got into Germany, the Germans that we were bringing back were uh, elderly, the home guard type. They, they would not be the cream of the army. We, towards the end of the war, we started bringing back um, uh, the ex-prisoners from the concentration camps where our planes were equipped to carry, I believe, 28 ambulatory patients, 24 stretcher patients. When we carried the, the concentration camp prisoners back, we probably had 50 or 60 of them in the airplane. Uh, we just, they would just put them in there and sit them down if we could find a place to sit. We'd take them back to a hospital in England for whatever services they needed. Uh, during this time, the navigational aids or the flying aids were not very well defined. Uh, there were some that we could use, so it, it became interesting low flying. You could see, still see the trenches of World War I east of Rams over towards Nancy. They were still very obvious on the ground. Uh, the uh, areas that we took as we went across France and Germany, I don't believe General Patton's army took anything but the older band because People who got off the autobahn had occasional bullet holes in the wings, so everybody flew right on the autobahn, hoped we didn't run together into each other. Towards the end of the war, they changed our squadron to, to flying a, a VIP. We flew the people like the general from Schaefer to different points. I had one trip where we took a group of them to Berlin right after the end of the war. Um, we had the four in our crew and our flight nurse wanted to go see Berlin too, so there were five of us. When we got there and they were going on a tour of the city, they asked us to go with them. And some well, two or three limousines drove up and then some GI trucks behind them. And they told us, well, you all go ahead and ride in the limousines. It was several weeks later before it dawned on us while we were in the limousines. Uh, the, the generals rode in the trucks. The, um, we would use Templehof Airdrome when we got to Berlin, and this became rather famous during the Berlin airlift where you would see all the planes landing over the apartment houses. Templehof was the main airport for Berlin. During the latter part of the war, we had VIPs that we would carry. Uh, we used to carry Queen Elizabeth of Belgium. This is Leopold's mother. She would be visiting uh, uh, refugee camps around Germany. And we would frequently pick her up and take her back to Brussels. Very nice lady. She wanted to stay in the cockpit the whole time rather than sit down. And she must have been in her 70s. I don't really know how old she was. Uh, during the latter part of the war, we flew USO troops around. Mickey Rooney's troop was one of them that we took. The Glenn Miller's troop was one. In fact, one of the airplanes of one of our squadrons was the one that lost him in the, in the English Channel. Uh, they never did figure out what happened. The, uh, we had a call early June. I had to take a, a French general and a couple of aides from Paris to Rings. We had no idea what we were going to do, just we flew French generals around frequently. So anyway, we went to Rams and the general told us to just wait, he'd be going home that afternoon. 
this was General Survey, um, sitting there on the airport, an English C-47 came in with about four or five Germans all in dress uniform. And again, we were wondering what in the world was going on around us. And then they called a little while later and told us to go ahead and get a billet. That we'd be and spend the night and go back the next day, which was fine. We took that time to wander around Rams and look at a few other sites. That night in the billet, early in the morning, two or three o'clock, there were people running around the hall yelling and screaming and shooting pistols off. And Lord, I didn't know whether we were in an air raid or what. I was ready to get under the bed. But when we peeped out, people were yelling, the war is over. And we finally found out that they had signed the peace treaty and General Survey was the signer for France. And we went back to Paris the next morning. Uh, we used to fly General Betts, who was the head of the war, tr war crimes trial. General Betts was, was a, evidently a retired general they had brought back, but a super nice person. Everybody loved to fly him. He had a, a WAC aide that he always that was always flying with him in Class A uniform. And while in our transport type planes, we did not wear parachutes. But the general would always make his aide put on a parachute, which was rather awkward with her dress and her skirt. But he'd just laugh about it and he would have a ball. Um, Is this a good time to hold up the book that you brought? Uh, during the, the course of the war when we were carrying uh, supplies and bringing back wounded, we carried flight nurses with us. And you can't say enough about those gals. They, they were some pretty tough gals with hard work. Because some of their patients back there really uh, were on their last leg. So I, you've got to give credit to those girls and their work. Never complain, and it was hard. The, the, uh, really, our, our whole unit, which is this type, Mm -hmm. This unit, we use C-47s for this. Our whole unit did essentially the same type of flying. Uh, we didn't have a, a, uh, a uh, contingent up in Norway and Sweden as a liaison. That I wasn't on that one, but our squadron had it. The, the, uh, Would you mind telling me about the Goody Birds and the Fairy Tales meaning, which many people may know, but younger people, right. teenagers might not? A Goody, Goody Bird was the slang name for a C-47 transport. Uh, the same thing the old airliners had before around 1940. Made by Douglas, about a 160 or 70 mile an hour airplane supposedly carried about 5,000 pounds of load, but frequently in Europe, considerably more. And our group was a mixture of four or five squadrons. Some had the name Fair Squadron, some had the name Air Transport, but they all did exactly the same thing. Uh, at times when we were flying the C-47s, while we were still based in England, down near Oxford, we occasionally would have to take a C-47 up to a depot for maintenance, major maintenance. Well, that's, the depot was up near Liverpool, and we still had to get home. By our fair end time, we knew all the operational officers at all the bases, the big depot bases. We could go ask them if they had any plane that had to be ferried down there. And even though we weren't in the ferry business, they would give us a plane, a P-38 or something that we'd take back 
down to our home base and then somebody would pick us up in a car. We didn't have parachutes with us, so we didn't have much choice. We'd just take our coat off and roll it up under us and sit on the coat. But it, it was an easy way to get home. Um, when we brought the B-17 back to be made into a bomb, we had a minor problem over the desert in Africa. The, the, one of the filters on the engines, air filters, did not come on and we were in the middle of a dust storm. Well, we didn't know anything had happened. We landed at Dakar and nothing seemed out of whack. We left Dakar to go to Natal in South America and oh, maybe a few minutes out we ran out of oil in one engine, so we just shut the engine down. It was a long flight, something like 10 or 11 hours. And so nobody worried about it because the rest of the flights were four or five hours, so it made no, really no difference. But each time we took off, the, our next flight, about four or five hours, we ran out all again. So the oil was lasting us shorter and shorter periods of time. And we got to where we would take off and feather the engine as soon as we could take off. We were still trying to get home and, and then go on up to crank it up to land it. The last time we did that, we, we had not run the engine five minutes, cranked it up to land it, and ran out of oil on the final approach. Mm -hmm. That happened to be at a nice base in Puerto Rico. So that was not bad to stay there for a week or so and get an engine changed. Then we took it on, on home. They gave us a navigator who was a, a B-17 navigator during the war, and he was coming home from the end of his tour. And uh, we always said he was kind of wacky, but he wasn't. He was a nice fellow. But when we got to Brazil, they gave us a couple of carrier pigeons in a box. They said there are headhunting tribes between here and Belém, Brazil, Natal and Belém. So when we got that and told the navigator now, one of these pigeons goes to Belém and one of these pigeons goes back to Natal. So if we have, we'll start out, put the Belém pigeon in front and as long as he's looking forward, we're going to Belém. And if we have to turn around, you just turn the box around and we'll follow, follow that pigeon back to that car. But anyway, with all of the baloney, we still made it alive. People. I guess everybody that's been in the service knows how much luck plays with it. They say, oh, there's no such thing with luck. There's too many cases where you had no choice. It was pure luck uh, and help of your friends. We, when we went to Iceland, now I know this is getting a ramble, but when we went to Iceland, we stopped at Stornoway. Stornoway was the home, is in the Hebrides Islands. It was the home of, of uh, where they made the, the, oh, the, the heavy wool. I can't think of the name of it all of a sudden. But anyway, the, yeah. the, the, the wool, anyway. It was an interesting trip to see that in that rather barren land. Uh, one time in Northern Ireland, we were based there for a while, several of us had gone to a theater to watch a movie in Belfast. And while we were sitting there, all of a sudden the lights in the theater came on. Uh, there were about four or five men on the stage, all of them with the hand machine guns. Mm -hmm. One fellow proceeds to make a speech for about three or four minutes for the Southern Catholic Division of Government. The lights went out, they left, and the movie came back on just like nothing ever happened. So I guess that's the way they, they operated. Uh, we were doing in London for, I guess it was the fall of 43 and one of early 44. We'd travel through London. When we would ferry an airplane down to the east coast of England, we'd have to go to London to get on the shuttle to come back to North Ireland. 
Uh, this was the time of the so-called baby blitz. And it was always amazing to be there when the, when the air raids would start and watch how little the English paid attention to it. They just went on their business. There were some in the subway tunnels, but mm -hmm. they just went on their business and did whatever they were going to do. Mm -hmm. And it got to be whether it was just a normal experience. It wouldn't be like that now. Well, we, we were in a lot of the cities that had been heavily bombed, like the port dock area of Liverpool, or most of the southern English ports were pretty badly damaged. But it gave you a chance to see what, 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 how people could operate under terrible condition. When uh, Again, after the troops started moving across France and Germany, you could tell how the war was going by who you brought back. When you brought back American kids or English kids. Okay, when the, when the war was over and they decided to send us home, they sent a group of about, my group had maybe 50 people in it. We were based in Paris at that time. They sent us up to a staging area up near Le Havre, up near the English Channel, the tent city. We stayed there about a week in November, cold and rainy. And then they put us on several of these little French 40 and 8 boxcars. And we rode the boxcars to Marseille for about three days to get on the boat. I don't know why we couldn't have left from La Havre, but we went all the way across France to get on the boat. We ended up coming home on a Liberty ship. It took 20 days to cross the ocean in December with no with very rough crossing. After we landed in New York, they immediately sent us to an area, uh, to, to a staging area to be discharged. Mine was lucky, I was Fort McPherson. So when I got to Fort Mac, they let us go and sent us home. And uh, that was about the end of my military career, except I stayed in the reserves. The, the, uh, when I came back, I could not get back in tech on the first quarter. It took... Uh, I got back in tech at the summer quarter and went straight through to finish. I have a degree in mechanical engineering. Uh, of course, Atlanta had not changed much from the time I was gone. Uh, it was still the same city. I, when, when I got out of tech, I went to work for a machinery manufacturer. We made uh, agricultural, vegetable, oil mill type equipment. I worked for them until, uh, when I think it was 1950, 51, I was recalled in the Korean War. Mm. And I was in that recall for a year. During that time, I was an instrument flight instructor down here at, at uh, Columbus, Georgia for a good bit of the time. And then up at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, in, in another type of military unit. I happened to be at the right place at the right time and they let us out in about a year. I went back, the fellow that I worked for with the first company has, was starting his own company at that time because the first company was going into a different line. So I went to work with him and I worked with him also making fertilizer oil mill equipment for, gosh it must have been 10 years. I ended up being the vice president of the company. This was a uh, family ownership type company. And when he, when the owner retired, or actually died, his son wanted to change the, the manufacturer. So uh, another fellow in the company and I became partners and we started the company that I still work with. We started out making similar type equipment and have since uh, 
gotten into making uh, specialized equipment, chemical plant equipment that we sell all over the world. And we have agents in, in nine different areas of the world. I'm still working for them even though I have sold my part of the company back to my partner. The, the, uh, while I was at Tech, uh, during my junior and senior time, I was a physics lab instructor. So that helped pay for my time back plus the GI Bill at that point. The, the, uh, Okay. During the time that I went to Georgia Tech in my junior year, I married Miriam Hallman, who is another native of Atlanta, and we ended up with three children, uh, and now we have three grandchildren. Uh, they range in age from one year to eleven and everybody seems to be very normal I guess, as normal as you could be. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, you've had a great career in military and in business. Well, May I ask about uh, a memory back, do you remember about when Pearl Harbor occurred, okay. where were you? At Pearl Harbor I was working for Southern Airways during the period of the first year that I had, after my first year at Tech, it was December 7th, it was a Sunday, it was a normal instruction day at Southern Airways, we worked seven days a week then, and we, uh, somebody came in and said something was going on, so we all we got around the radio and listened. But I was at work then, and when I heard about it, all, it was about, I worked for Southern Airways after that about eight or nine months, and then went to the, uh, I don't know if you'd call it enlisted, but I, I applied to be a flight instructor, Air Force flight instructor, which I was accepted. I spent about a month at Central Instructor School in Maxwell Field, mainly to get the procedures they wanted taught, and then was sent to Cochran Field in Macon as a flight instructor, and stayed there until oh, June or July of, of the following year. And that's then I went to Europe and started the time in ETO. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for sharing your account. Well, I doubt if it will make sense now. But, <laughs> but anyway, I was lucky to survive it all, and I'm thankful to have survived it. I'm thankful to have ended up with as nice a family as we've got. They've made that part real easy. Mm -hmm. And it has been really a very nice life. And in traveling around the world, both in business since then, they had the place I would have for them to live, except Atlanta, by far the nicest place in the world. That's wonderful.